I finally have version 1 of pretty much everything I need to start running some motors. There are four parts so far, three of which I designed with the last one luckily being available off the shelf. This is the main processor which is where all of the motion control magic will happen along with all the other high level functions like running programs and running the user interface. However this isn't just a normal microcontroller though. There's something very special about this processor that makes it much better suited for running the robot than something like an Arduino or even a Raspberry Pi. Not only does it have two cores running at up to 666 megahertz, but it has an FPGA built in as well. So a common microcontroller like an Arduino tends to have one main processor that runs the code you write, but there's a lot more than just the processor inside of one of those chips. If we look at the block diagram for one of STM's small microcontrollers, it shows all the major parts inside of the chip. As you can see, there is a lot more in there than just the processor which is up in the top left. Along with all of the clock and bus controls, it also has a set of peripherals. That's what all of these blocks that point outside of the chip are. They connect to the external pins and do stuff like generating PWM signals or serial communication. What's cool about these is that they are done in hardware, meaning they use physical logic gates and don't run software like the main processor does. Oftentimes the interface between the processor and the peripherals is buried away under the library that uses it to give the programmer a nice simple function to use. But the reality is every time you change a PWM output or even turn a pin on or off, the processor is just setting a bunch of registers at those peripherals to get the desired result. But why even have peripherals you might ask? Can't you just read and write to the pins directly and handle signals like that? Well yes you can. If you wanted to output a PWM signal, you could very well have the processor talk directly to the pin through a GPIO port and simply turn a pin on and off, adjusting the delay times to get whatever duty cycle you want. The reason peripherals normally exist is because they can run independent from the processor. So for PWM, the processor can configure it once and it will stay running without the processor doing anything. If you want to change the duty cycle, the processor will simply change a value in the peripheral register and the output will update accordingly. This is great since it takes the work of counting and flipping the pin away from the processor and does it in hardware instead. There are also much fancier functions that can be used such as the DMA or direct memory access controller. This can allow an interface peripheral such as a USART or universal synchronous asynchronous receive transmit or more commonly referred to as simply serial to send and receive data directly from the processor memory. The DMA does this by moving data directly between the peripheral and the memory. This way you can create a variable with all the data you want to send in software, then tell the peripheral to use it, and have it send much longer arrays of data without needing the processor to babysit the serial peripheral if it needed to send one byte at a time. If we look back at the processor I'm using for the robot, I said this thing includes an FPGA, which stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. What that means is that it has a whole bunch of programmable logic in it, basically thousands of flip-flops and lookup tables that it can combine to make all sorts of crazy stuff. Stuff like the peripherals in this other chip, but unlike the ones included in this which are static and can only be configured for certain pins, FPGAs have basically no rules. You can program them to do whatever you want. Want to output a different PWM signal on every pin? No problem, just program a ton of these timer blocks in. Want to communicate with a bunch of devices at high speeds? Also no problem, the programmable logic can often run at over 100 MHz and has no problem doing so. Want to run a whole control system for a guided rocket? Okay, well maybe that's a bit out of range for this one. For that you'd need the defense grade version. Aside from acting like peripherals and directly controlling pins, the logic can also be configured for more processing specific tasks. Many microcontrollers have a logic block in them called the floating point unit that is used for doing computations with floating point numbers. This small one doesn't since it's designed to be super low power and cheap, but if we look at the diagram from a larger chip, this one is actually from the servo drive, you can see the FPU up here next to the processor. The reason there is a dedicated block for this is since it provides a huge performance boost over the processor doing it alone. The FPGA can be configured for similar specific processing tasks. If you wanted you could even build this entire processor inside of the FPGA logic. Anyway, my point is, is that they're super cool and let you do a bunch of neat stuff. For me specifically, the FPGA is currently going to handle the interfaces to the drives and encoders, along with the high speed control loops that run each motor.
I'm not currently planning on doing much in the way of processing in it other than some control loops and safety checks, but it remains an option in the event I run into processing limitations with using the main processors only. Luckily, since these chips are at least semi-common, someone has already made a board with all of the necessary components for it. The first board I actually designed was this one, which the processor board plugs into. All it does is generate a few different voltages from a 24 volt input to run the processor and whatever cards are plugged in, then also runs 22 of the FPGA pins to each of the slots. The next board gets plugged into one of those slots. It's basically for ruggedizing the FPGA signals so they can make it to and from whatever device you want to communicate with. It does this by connecting the FPGA pins to a device called a transceiver, which is what all of these chips near the output port are. They convert the single-ended signal from the FPGA to a differential signal. They also drive the signals at higher voltage and current to help keep them from being affected by external noise. The transceivers also have added protection to keep events like short circuits and static discharges from killing them, although I also added some additional external protection diodes to help. All of the transceivers in total give me 10 data channels that can be configured for different modes by these I.O. expanders and buffers. The reason I'm using these expanders instead of the FPGA pins directly is since I don't want to waste any of them for low speed configuration stuff. Each channel can be configured for one of three modes. RS-485, which is a single pair receive transmit. This is nice since only one pair is needed and you still get bidirectional data, just not both directions at once. RS-422, which is two pairs, one for receive and one for transmit. This lets you do both at once at the expense of needing to run an extra pair. The final mode is also two pairs, but both being receive in case you wanted to use something like a quadrature encoder that only outputs. The I.O. expanders also run a few indicator LEDs, a couple 5 volt power supplies, and a 24 volt electronic fuse. These jumpers select which of the two output supplies each side of the connector receives, either 5 volt or 24 volt. They are both switched and monitored by the main processor through the I.O. expanders. That way in the event of a short circuit if something happens with the field wiring, it won't break anything and also won't cut power to the processor right away, giving it a chance to stop safely. The current setup to run my robot would have six of the channels used in RS-485 mode for the robot encoders, then an additional one or two in RS-422 mode to communicate with the drives. Which brings me to the last and most complicated board. You may remember the first one of these I made from the last video. This one basically does the same thing, only now it's a bit more ruggedized and hopefully has a better layout. Here we have the new version of the servo drive, or at least the output portion of it. I guess technically this entire thing would count as the servo drive, since some of the control loops are done in here. The first two connectors over here are RJ45 jacks, which allow the drives to plug into one another so they can be daisy chained and then also plug into the board we looked at previously. This is where the drives get their 24 volt logic power and also where they get the RS-422 communication to interface with the main processor. The next connector is for something called safe torque off or STO. When working with high power motors it's important to make sure there are safety systems in place. Most of the time this is just an e-stop button that somehow disconnects the main power supply. Safe Torque Off provides another way of ensuring the drive cannot output any power. It has two inputs that then go through opto-isolators, one of which goes to the gate drivers and disables them. That way, the gate drivers cannot turn on the output FETs to output any power. The second channel goes to the microcontroller, which disables its PWM generation. The reason we have two separate channels is so in the event one of them somehow fails, there's a backup one to catch. These two little sensors here monitor each of the channels and report back to make sure they're good. That way you can have an external device monitoring the entire system is working properly. Next up we have some dip switches on the bottom side of the board. These are for simply addressing which board is which whenever you have multiple chained together. These two large connectors are for connecting to the DC bus where these drives get their main power, and this large connector is for outputting to the motor phases. This last connector is for voltage sensing before a line reactor, so these drives can also rectify power from a wall to supply the DC bus. This is a super cool function that I don't think I've seen anywhere before, which is a bit concerning since that usually means there's a reason not to do it, but we'll see eventually.
I have done some basic testing on everything and there have been a couple fixes, mostly just some soldering issues, but I did have one major board error as evident by the bodge wires. Unfortunately, there does seem to be quite a lot more oscillation around the MOSFET switching than there probably should be, mostly because I forgot to order a few components, namely these high frequency capacitors that are supposed to go here, and I only ordered very low value gate drive resistors, so these MOSFETs are being switched way harder than they probably should be. However, I was able to get some very simple current loops running, and so far nothing exploded, so I'm going to count that as a win. The other boards aren't nearly as complicated and don't appear to have any major issues yet. I'm still working on getting FOC working, mostly due to a bunch of weird software issues or getting distracted while looking through the microcontroller manual. What the heck does entropy source validation do? What was I doing again? But, once I get a motor spinning, I'll go over exactly how the drive works and what the software is doing in some more future videos. If you think this stuff is cool, consider joining the Discord where you can discuss projects and Patreon supporters get to do stuff like controlling the robot with the old controller live.